Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 Online Spring Festival. My name is Jane Clements, and I'm the Marketing and Project Manager for this year for Pentawards. The theme for this year is how design can drive a key role in driving positive change. And we're really excited to have some incredible speakers lined up for today. We'll be having a very short Q&A at the end of today's session and at the end of each session. So if you have any questions, just drop them in the box at the bottom of your screen. Before we start, I'd like to say a quick thank you to UPM Raffle Attack, the Prosa, Kurz, OI and Tappy. And at the end of today's sessions, in the final one, we're going to give you a little exclusive about the Live Pentawards Festival happening in November. Up next, and a warm welcome to Lee Barnsley, who is the Global Head of Design and Experience at Reckitt. He will be speaking to us about how brands are making a difference. Hi, Lee. Hey, how are you doing? Good. How are you today? Yeah, not too bad. Looking, looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. I can't wait to hear your talk. Yes, yeah. I hope everyone's going to find it interesting. I hope they will. I hope people at least take one thing away with them today, because at least we'll be in a better place than we were yesterday. Um, but um, yeah, let's uh, let's let's get into it, shall we? Yeah, I'll hand it over to you. You're, the virtual stage is all yours. Lovely. Okay. So, design for positive change. I'm hoping um, everyone can see this. I can't. I can't see it, Lee. For the just part. one second. There's always technical difficulties. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hoping so now you can now see this. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, lovely. All right. So, yep. Thank you for the introduction. Hello, everybody, wherever you're watching today. Firstly, let me introduce myself. I'm Lee Barnsley, Global Head of Design and Brand Experience of the Health Business Unit in Reckitt. Um, for this talk, I'm going to be discussing the role of design and why designers and the brands that we work with are best placed to drive change. So a little bit about me. I've been at Reckitt for just over three years. And prior to that, I was a creative director, designer, agencies all over the world, working with companies such as Heineken, Nestle, Tesco, GSK, to name just a few. You know, and in that time, I've seen a hell of a lot of brands have a lot of success, but I've seen a lot of brands have not so much success. But if there's one thing my experience has taught me, it's that the world is constantly evolving. And the way we design and consume brands is changing at a rapid pace. So. What are the big challenges that brands face today in relation to design? Well, I'll share my thoughts on this. And I hope that even if you just take one thing away with you from the presentation today, as I say earlier, we're in a much better place than we were yesterday. So I want to talk a little bit about our role as designers. Well, what is our role? Well, in all honesty, the answer to that isn't that simple. You know, our role needs to evolve, you know, as society evolves around us, as technology evolves around us. As new technology emerges, our role becomes, well, it should become different um, year by year, day by day, brand by brand. So, you know, when you look at the evolution of design, you know, 50 years ago, it was all about advertising. It was all about comms. When you look at 40 years ago, the birth of the internet was, you know, was a big, big um, shockwave moment in terms of design and the way that we looked at brands. 20 years ago, e-commerce came along, you know, Amazon, everyone knows what Amazon is, um, but it had a profound effect on the way that we would consume brands and the way that we as designers would think about our brands and how we approached our projects. 10 years ago, social took over the world. You know, it's having a huge impact even today on how we as designers are approaching things like brand identity. You know, if we're thinking about digital first, it's completely different to when we were thinking about how our brand turned up on a shelf 30, 40 years ago. So we as designers, as I say, you know, it's evolving. Today, there's a huge focus on sustainability and social impact. You know, what is our responsibility in the world? I think that that's something that I'm going to talk a little bit more at length about that um, today. And what does the future hold? Well, we know that AI 
it's all over all over the internet right now. Um, I'm sure you've seen on socials, AI is having a profound effect on designers. Um, augmented reality and mixed reality are probably going to be a lot more prevalent in the future. And of course, Web 3.0 is coming. I'm not going to go into that today because that's a whole different um, presentation, but it's really interesting when you start to think about how brands and we as designers support those brands in that future um, channels. So as designers, it's really worth reminding ourselves that um, the important part we play on the world that we live in. So design is a really integral part of society and the impact of brands can be felt across all aspects of our lives. So as designers, we have a responsibility to create products and experiences that are not only visually appealing, but now also socially responsible. So designers really need to shift their thinking beyond aesthetics and focus on how we can make a positive impact on people's lives and the environment. So I'm gonna talk about three small topics today, sustainability, social impact, and innovation. So let's start with sustainability. Well, sustainability from a designer's perspective, tends to be about um, substrates. You know, there's a lot of com conversation around substrates, but sustainable design is really about creating products and services that meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of our future generations. But we know there's a huge tension there. 84% um, of people say sustainability is important when making purchasing decisions, but 47% say it costs too much. 86% of consumers consider the amount of packaging when they're buying products, but 35% want more packaging to protect them from infection and illness. And 61% of, of consumers want more information to help them make better choices, but only 20% check those claims. So there's clearly a lot more that we can do as designers to really help support people and take them on the journey when it comes to our brands. I want to share with you some uh, interesting examples of um, brands or companies that are starting to change the game a little bit. So Polytag is an interesting company. They are embracing this idea of this circular economy. And what they actually do is they've developed a system where they can print a unique every time QR code on packaging. What that enables um, people to do is to trace the life cycle of that particular piece of packaging. It also allows retailers to um, introduce some kind of deposit return scheme where you, the, the consumer gets a monetary value back. But the company is utilizing things like blockchain te technology um, to actually enable that piece of packaging to um, eventually maybe replace um, barcodes on packs. It also is a, is, you know, QR codes are quite prevalent in terms of conversation right now in design. Like, how do you create those connected experiences? So, you know, is this going to be the future? We don't know. But, you know, look, when you look at the engagement rates so far on some of the trials that they've done with the likes of Prince's Gate and Ocado, there's clearly a, a, a market for it. And even the UK government now are under consultation with, with potentially rolling this out uh, nationally in 2025. So, it's coming. Um, I think it's something that we should all take note of. Another company that are doing really interesting things is Notpla. Now, you might have heard of Notpla because they won the Earthshot Prize in 2022. Um, but rather than me telling you all about them, I'm going to let a little video do it for me. So I know we're on Zoom, so it might be a little bit stuttery, but um, let's see how we go.
So as I'm sure you'd agree, some interesting technology there, but it's not just about systems and materials that are starting to break through. We're also seeing a lot of brands working in partnership with each other to repurpose things such as waste into new and incredible things. So everybody's familiar with the brand Nespresso. So they have partnered with brands such as Zeta to create the first range of sneakers that are made from used coffee grounds. I don't know how they do it, probably some kind of magic, but um, it's basically the equivalent of 12 espressos in every pair of trainers. So really, really inventive way of um, solving a problem around waste and recycling. They've also partnered with a company called Velocity, who are actually turning used Nespresso capsules into bikes um, on the aptly named Recycle. So um, I think it just shows you that um, through the power of design thinking, you know, you can really come up with some innovative ways to answer a lot of the problems around sustainability that we're seeing at the moment. Which moves me on to the next topic, um, social impact. So how do we move, how do we move beyond materials and utilize design to benefit society? So we know that um, social impact is a big thing right now, but what do we mean by social impact? So it's about using design to solve social problems to make the world a better place. So at Reckit, we often talk about human-centered design, designing products that meet the needs of people, no matter where they live, no matter what they earn, or whatever their gender. So by understanding people's needs and designing solutions that address those needs, companies can create a truly positive impact on people's lives. On Reckit, we're hugely passionate about this topic, and I'd love to share with you two projects that we're extremely proud of. So if you're anything like me, who's got young kids, um, how do you get kids to wash their hands more often and ensure that their health and education isn't impacted out as a result? Well, out of this question, Hygiene Quest was born. So Dettol is one of the, the brands that um, I oversee. Um, what we did was develop a hybrid learning program about a group of characters that would go off on adventures, solving problems along the way, relating to health and hygiene habits. So we created a physical and digital assets brand world that combines storytelling to teach children about the importance of good hygiene habits. So far, Hygiene Quest has been launched and trialed in schools and communities across the UK, Nigeria, Malaysia, Italy, and Australia. It's had a profound impact in such a short time that it's been in existence. So far, we can see that we've probably got an additional 640 million hands washed over the next two years. It's resulted in a 14.6% reduction in diarrhea among school kids in India. It's resulted in a 7.3% reduction of diarrhea among school kids in Nigeria. And it reduced COVID rates in Italian schools by 14%. I mean, it's, it's incredible just the, the impact that something so simple when you think about it in terms of design thinking that has a huge impact on society at large so you know there, there's some incredible stats there you know this idea around this social return on investment from doing this is 4.8 to 1 you know you think about the value of education you think about those additional avoided healthcare costs you know it goes much beyond just being a bit of a part of the brand world it's about really improving society there's another project which um, the Reckitt team are hugely passionate about, and I'm sure you may have seen this across socials um, in the last couple of months, something called the gender pain gap. So what is the gender pain gap? Well, it's the phenomenon in which pain in women is more poorly understood and mistreated compared to pain in men due to systematic gaps and biases. It's a huge problem when you think about it. So. Some of the figures that um, we know from uh, doing a bit of research are quite um, quite shocking. You know, one in six women experience severe pain every day. Women in pain are more often and more severely treated than men. Sorry, women in pain are more often and more severe. Women are in sorry, I can't even talk. Women are in pain more often and more severely than men. And over one in two women feel they've had their pain ignored or dismissed because of their gender. Things like that shouldn't be happening in today's world, should it, in reality? So Neurofen have developed something called See My Pain. Um, it's a purpose-driven approach 
that will see the brand address that gap head on. So you're going to see a lot of activation over the next few months. This was the start of it. It was the beginning of that kind of journey going out into the world. But what you're going to see is um, Neurofen committed to gender balanced clinical trials. We're going to develop new research to better understand pain in women. And we're going to ensure we have an innovation pipeline that brings new and improved solutions for women's pain. So on this topic, I think Reckitt and Neurofen were just getting started. So that's just a little bit of a glimpse of what the work we're doing at Reckitt on social impact. But what about innovation? So how can designers approach innovation in a way that delivers growth for brands? So design thinking is a good place to start, but what is design thinking? Well, design thinking is a problem solving approach that's rooted in empathy and understanding of the needs of the user. So it can drive innovation and brand experiences that make significant impact on people's quality of life. Design thinking isn't something we can do on our own though. You know, as collectives, we need to work collaborative, collaboratively with experts from different fields to create new products, new services that meet the demands of society and the environment around us. But what are the barriers to innovation? Well, you need to find people in your business that are really understanding of what design thinking is and its role. You know, there's a lot of businesses that are really short term focused and that's fine, you know, because a lot of brands tend to be quite tactical. And the reality is that big companies are hugely risk averse. You know, if you think about a one or 2% drop in sales, that's big numbers on some big companies. So you often hear from a lot of people, yeah, but what if this project fails? And we hear that a lot on, our, on our, a lot of projects. But guess what? You know, 90% of FMCG startups fail within the first six to 12 months. So, you know, it's because they're looking at that immediate kind of short-term return. They're looking at something at launch and it's got to be successful straight away. You know, it's got to be, I've got to see results in six months. And ultimately, a lot of innovation and a lot of new brands fail because of that mindset. They need to start looking at the long game. So what if you went into an innovation project with the mindset, hey, it's all right if it fails, but what if we went in the mindset of this might not work? It takes that pressure off the project teams and your agencies to allow you to develop a different approach mindset. So if you go in with the approach of, you know, this might not work, that's fine. Because what you can do is you can learn from what happens. You can develop it, you can improve it, and you can come back with something even better. It's what one of my agencies always likes to refer to as always in beta. You know, if you view innovation as an end point, you're not really innovating. You know, the way we consume brands, the way we experience brands, it's changing at such a rapid pace. You know, how will shopping habits, consumers and the world around us impact our brands in the future? So you've got to constantly evolve as designers. If you don't, you end up running, risk, running the risk of being one of these guys. You know, they were sat on their laurels. They thought everybody was going to be using video players for forever. And we you know what happened when Netflix came along. So innovation is about, you know, finding a start point. And a good start point of that is to create a lighthouse. And I don't mean go out there and build a lighthouse, you know, literally on the end of a, of a, uh, or in a rock. It's about developing a vision that becomes a bit of a guiding light for what your brand should look like in 10, 15, 20 years time. You know, develop a vision that challenges your teams, your category, your business, and even your manufacturing processes. You know, the car industry, develop concept cars that provide a vision of the future. Lego even recently developed an implemented long-term vision to rebuild the world. I think they're saying something like 30 year plan. You know, why shouldn't any brand behave in that same way? One thing I always say to a lot of the designers is, don't wait for, wait for those briefs to come to you because they may never, never happen. You know, we as design leaders and design thought leadership should be the ones pushing for these type of, of projects and these type of vision pieces. Um, because unfortunately, the reality is a lot of marketing teams are very short term focused. They're focused on pipelines that are three, four, five years maximum. So you need to develop lighthouse pieces so that you know where that brand is heading and you can really steer that creative thinking in that direction. So another part of innovation is you really need to identify who you're talking to. So why is it crucial to identify that so that you have success? 
We know that most innovation falls flat and being the big waste of time and money if you don't talk to them to the right people. You end up back where you started um, because it wasn't grounded in any clear consumer insight or human truth. So there is a gentleman on, uh, on social media called Simon Sinek, who's pretty active. Um, go and check him out. But he introduced me to something called the law of diffusion of innovation. Now, it sounds big and fancy, but it's actually fairly simple. So before I get into that, imagine for a minute that you get a brief from your client, your internal team, whoever it might be. There's always a section labeled, who is our target consumer? And I can tell you from my experience, it's pretty generic. You know, I want to target Gen Z. I want to target young families. I want to target men aged 24 to 32 who love the color blue. You know, we all know those briefs, we've seen them. But what the law of diffusion of innovation tells us is this. Society is made up of five different types of people. There are these big ideas people that make up 2.5%. You know, you're like your Walt Disney, your Steve Jobs, your Elon Musk. Then you've got this 13.5%, which is like your early adopters. So these are the people that are willing to sacrifice time, money, energy, to experience something that reflects their own beliefs. They'll stand in line for eight hours to watch a Marvel movie, even though they can get a ticket like everyone else a week later. That's, 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 you know, that's really, really interesting. And then you have the early and late majority. You know, this group is really cynical. They're tough to crack. They're always like, what's in it for me? You know, I'm happy with what I have. I don't have time to explore different things. You know, they're, 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 a, they're a tough one. And then you have your laggards. They're only there because somebody told them to be, or they have nothing else better to do. So we kind of ignore them. The issue with innovation is a lot of companies or a lot of brands tend to focus on this middle section. It's the biggest group, and it's the one where brands think there is the most potential. They ask themselves, how do we get these people engaged? The trouble is, these people don't want to try something new until somebody else has tried it first. So what do you do? You ignore those people. You should focus all your time and energy when you're coming up with innovation on these early adopters. They could come from any walk of life, any age, any gender. They live and breathe and almost worship your purpose, your brand, your company. They do it purely for the love of it, not for the monetary gain. So what you should do when you're launching any type of innovation is find that niche. Find something that really talks to them on a one-to-one -one level. I think a really good, interesting example of this is Liquid Death. You know, Liquid Death four years ago didn't really exist as a brand. You know, it was originally the brainchild of Mike Cesario. He was a graphic designer. He'd previously worked at Netflix as a creative director, and he was inspired to create Liquid Death after watching concert goers drink water out of monster energy cans. He wondered, why has nobody marketed water in a similar manager, manner to Monster? So Liquid Death was born. It was initially marketed towards heavy metal and punk rock fans. So that niche. He found his niche of early adopters, and along the way, developed some pretty crazy marketing campaigns. And I'd recommend you go and check out his YouTube channel or the Liquid Death YouTube channel. In just four short years, the company has gone from nothing to now being valued at over $700 million. So it just goes to show that by forgetting that mass market appeal and developing something that feels hugely focused, hugely niche, you can actually carve out huge potential for your brand so it's i think it's something that a lot of briefs a lot of designers a lot of companies often lose sight of when they're working on projects you know all too often i see um npd launches and you think does the world really need another one of those you know like what is the real point of difference in that in that brand in that product what's it bringing to the consumer that it can't already get in from products that are already out there so just really something to be mindful of so in summary, I know I've malted through this really, really quickly. Um, I think in summary, you know, we talk about design for positive change. So I hope you've learned a few things from this session. But I think some of the things that I'd like you to take away is, you know, sustainability, what it's all about. It's about creating products and services that meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations. Social impact is all about using design to solve social problems and make the world a better place. And innovation is about focusing on early adopters, 
finding your niche rather than focusing on mass market success. And if you do that, success will come. And with that, I know I've finished a little bit early. I've motored through that. But if there's any questions from people that are on the call, I'd love to um, answer a few. Great, thank you, Lee. Those are some really, really good examples. Um, there's a couple of questions that I have as well and that we've also had someone uh, come through with. So <laughs> my personal question is, you know the Nopla capsules, have you actually tried one of them? I haven't personally, have you? <laughs> No, I haven't, although we do have um, another one of our jury members for the Panther Wars competition who did try one once on a call with us. And, you know, he was quite uh, amused by it. He, he was quite engaged with it. So I think it would be really interesting to see how that works with the different kind of flavours and textures that you kind of showcased, um, especially when you've got more of like the cocktails as well as the drinks and the water. I think that would be quite interesting. I think the interesting thing for that brand is um, as they start to develop the technology even further, you know, there's probably going to be further applications around rigidity, you know, and when, when they start, when they figure out how to get that poly, those kind of formats into more rigid structures um, versus what they currently have today, which is around these little liquid sachets. Yeah. That's, that's going to unlock, you know, so much potential for that, that brand in the world, really. I think, yeah. that, you know, they're, they're already looking at food trays, um, I think they did it with um, Just Eat. Um, yes, I saw that, yeah. Yeah, that were biodegradable, you know, versus what's currently out there in the world. So um, I think as the technology improves and, uh, you know, the, they um, they understand more around how they can improve this brand experiences, I think we're going to see a lot more of that technology coming through. What would be something that you would think would be really interesting to come through next as like along that kind of pathway of kind of maybe ed edible packaging or packaging that we can really kind of reuse in another way or be used in a different way? I think one of the things we chat a lot about um, internally is we're not going to get out of this problem about pack with from plastic or our, our issues with overuse of reliability on plastic through the traditional design thought that we're current pattern that we're currently in. I think that what you're going to see is new technologies to maybe break down plastic. So not necessarily about taking that completely out, out the food out, out the food chain. You know, it's yeah. about developing technologies and idea that you know is this is there some kind of microbiome that can break down the plastic? You know, is, is there some kind of um, natural based chemical that can disintegrate plastic when you put it in it? You know, I think that. There's, there's, there's two kind of almost paths I see happening in terms of that idea around how you kind of address this plastic issue. One is plastic reduction, the other is through technology and, and invention. I think that's the only way we're going to crack it. Right. Uh, and another question, we've got a couple that have popped up on the Q&A. So um, do you think that clients are more willing now to change dramatically uh, in sustainability and new production processes than perhaps they were beforehand? I, from personal experience, I think there's still a lot of pushback from a lot of big companies because mm -hmm. it's, there's, there's a big CapEx investment required to change manufacturing processes to meet a lot of these sustainability goals. I think that... Um, there's obviously much more that brands and uh, we as designers can do to push that um, those ideas. But I think that, as I said in, in my presentation, you know, big companies are hugely risk averse. You know, if there's if there's any inkling that it might affect the perception of their brand or the perception of that um, efficacy of their brand, they're not going to do it because they're worried about that drop in sales. So I think that that you know there are specialist teams now within companies who are really pushing for it we have, i've seen it in a lot of um a lot of our peers that they have uh, purpose built sustainability teams where they are exploring new technologies they're looking at whether we do need to change our manufacturing processes to meet those sustainability goals but um this is where you know i would encourage a lot of people if they're on the call watching to to work with designers to think about through design thinking how you can answer a problem not necessarily in the not in the way that you're probably thinking it needs to be answered. Mm. You know, it might not be about changing your production line to meet to, to to adapt to a new bottle, which then results in less production. You know, happening. I think that um, it's a it's a really interesting challenge, and I, and I think it's one that 
is not an easy one to answer is the, is the honest answer. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the so times are changing, aren't they? And people are still kind of getting to grips with it in that sense. Yeah, and we're, and we're even seeing, um, you know, there's even backlash now towards formats that people perceive to be more sustainable, you know, like glass. You know, yeah, we're, yeah. we're now realising that glass is probably worse than plastic for its carbon impact. So, yeah, you, I mean, as, as we learn more about it and the technology evolves, I think that um, we will see new things coming through. Um, and another question, actually, when you were talking about the Dettol um, case study, um, something that I just wondered from that, you know, you were talking about kind of adapting to needs and obviously Dettol viruses, COVID, uh, which, you know, is still kind of lingering. Um, did that kind of did that kind of really have an effect on like the design angle behind products, you know, the kind of cleansing, disinfectant type of products that you work with, like that kind of bolster some kind of innovation and need for change? Or like, how did it kind of affect affect you in that sense? Yeah, on a brand like Dettol, it, it actually un unlocked a lot of doors for us in yeah. that, um, you know, and I, I've posted quite a lot on my own um, social channels about the impact that COVID had on a brand like Dettol. You know, there was never really a, a brand up there in the top 10 brands in the world that was a, a germ protection brand. You know, there was there was all these food brands, there was all these drinks brands um, and personal care brands. But, it, but you know, from my opinion, it was, it was probably the time was right for a, a hygiene or a, a germ protection brand to take its place up amongst yeah. all that. And yeah. COVID just accelerated that, if I'm being honest. You know, the, the brand Dettol was always on an upward, upward trajectory anyway. COVID just amplified it, you know, incredibly. And what it allowed us to do was to then start to look at other areas for innovation that we wouldn't necessarily have looked at before. Um, Dettol, I mean, I can go into it, I'll talk about Dettol all day, <laughs> but it's a hugely complex brand that wherever you are in the world, it's seen as something different. You know, like here in the UK, we see it as a surface cleaning brand. In China, it's a laundry brand. Yeah. In in India, it's a personal care brand. They have shower gels and body washes and you know bar soap. It, it, so it's it's a hugely complex brand with, I think, a reach like no other brand in the world. So things like COVID, and, you know, and germ protection and being making sure that your family were protected and safe, um, just had a profound effect on on the, on a lot of um, brands like Dettol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not surprising, I guess, is it? No. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Lee, so much for taking us through that. Um, it was a really interesting presentation. Um, our next session will be at one o'clock today with Lara Kabaj, who is working at Blue Air, which is part of Unilever. She has over 10 years experience working with international FMCG brands, and she'll be talking about the beauty in purposeful design. So look forward to seeing you then. Thanks again, Lee. No problem. See you soon. Yeah.